There we go. Sorry, I was filling up water. No problem. Okay, so this is about a half marathon, but this can be even 800 meter training. This can be a, a full marathon. I've coached marathoners, I've coached ultra marathoners, I've coached half milers. So the approach is what I want to go through today. And the goal is to run a half marathon in under one hour, 30 minutes, which is why the document is called Project 130. Now we may tweak this to be 140 or 145 or 135, but for now, I just want to go through some of the, you know, the, the, the points of, of programming in general for running. And then I want everyone to chime in on some of the concepts, the recovery methods, so on and so forth. So there's like seven theories that I believe in as a track coach. One, you know, you cannot run a spin. If you want to run 12 meter per second, like Usain Bolt, running at 10 meter per second is not going to make you run 12, right? You have to run the speed comfortably at some point or another. That's number one. Number two, especially for 800 meters and up, and I think Chris Coy can chime in after on this, but I really believe in multi-pace training. I heard about this uh, back in the days of Gary Reed of Canada uh, when I saw his program and that was like, bing, that was the, the, uh, the ticket. So what it means that you have to be able to run the same as race pace, which is usually modeling of, of a race model. Uh, you have to run slower at race pace and you gotta run faster. You gotta do speed work. You gotta get used to running turnover. Number three, I think traditional middle long distance coaches use three key workouts. And I covered this on my tempo talk a while ago, and that's recovery run, steady state run, and tempo runs. Now tempo runs in this case is different than tempo as a sprinter. Uh, number four about steady state, you have to run it or should run it just below the anaerobic threshold, which is the point where lactate sets in. If you were to run this test on a treadmill, it would be like a hockey stick. You would run, increase speed, run, and at some point there's a deflection point like a hockey stick that goes up. And that's the point where you wanna train just before that stick goes up because you wanna train um, in long distance. You don't want the lactic acid. For 400 meter sprinters, a different ball game, but for this case, a half marathoner, you want your steady state to be not a lactate workout. If you want a lactate workout, trust me, I can give you some lactate workouts. But in this case, that's not the goal. Before any workout, you always ask yourself, what's the goal of the workout? What's the purpose of the workout? And that should set the tone. Also for 800 meters and above, um, I'm really tired about people putting in garbage mileage. People run miles for the sake of doing miles, especially half marathon, half milers. They go out and run, you know, uh, you know, 40 minutes every morning because they got to put it in, you know, you know, you're better off, you know, sleeping in, getting massage, active recovery. But that's, that's my point. That's my theory. Um, the next one is about what I call the three quarter rule. I really believe you need to do a check mark at three quarters the distance of your race pace. So for 400 meter runners, 300 is my magic number is my magic point. Um, so in this case, a, a half marathoner, it would be one hour would be, um, or 15 K would be three quarter distance. Uh, and, and if you are running on a treadmill because of, you know, the pandemic or, you know, you live in Alaska or it's raining like in England, then you're going to set your treadmill at this pace and just run for an hour and see if you can keep it up. And the last thing I want to talk about on the scientific side is this whole max heart rate uh, debate. You've heard 220 minus your age, which I never believed in. I've always believed 220 minus your age plus or minus 10%. Uh, there was some new research I read about it should be 211 minus age times 0.64. Uh, it's roughly about 12 to 14 points higher than the above formula. So I believe in this formula and maybe add, you know, 10 points, 12 points, 10%. Um, that's your max heart rate. Uh, again, this is something to be debated. So that's my seven theories. Okay. So this is what I, I believe in, in, in any kind of training for 800 and up. Um, okay. So let's get into some assumptions. Let's say for, uh, for Renata, we're only going to train three days a week because that's all she has time for. She can cross train, she can do active recovery, uh, but three days a week is her ideal goal. And we assume a half marathon is 20 weeks away. It can be 18 weeks away, uh, more or less. So that's kind of the assumptions that we're working on and we work backwards. 
So what does that mean for pace? Well, here are the real numbers. Uh, like it or not, um, I'm a big fan of Excel, as, as you all know. And um, a 130 half marathon, as we know, is 14.1K per hour on a treadmill. That's also a 21, 15, 5K times, you know, uh, times four. Uh, it's also a 324, 800 meter split on the track. So, so if you're serious about running a marathon in one and a half hours, 90 minutes, you have to be able to run this pace comfortably on a track or faster. You have to run this pace or a bit faster than 5K and you should be able to run 15K in about 103 or treadmill at 14.1. So this is what I think you need to do, you know, give or take, you know, weather conditions and, and stuff like that, how you feel. But this is the guideline, right? You can't train at um, you know, um, 50 minute 10K and expect to run 129, right? That's not gonna happen, right? It's just not gonna happen. <laughs> okay, so a couple of little things here to go. Uh, so yeah, so basically when it comes to pace, I explain what I think your pace should be. You really have to go faster than 324 on your 800 meter uh, intervals. Uh, if you wanna do three laps, like 1200, we can calculate that. If you wanna do 400, we can calculate that. But this is kind of the speed that you're expected to run at or faster. And 5K times, 10K times, these are good steady state workouts. Uh, because this is the speed of your half marathon, you shouldn't feel like burnt out after. You should feel pretty good. After a good little warm up, you should be able to clock 21.15 on 5K and, and walk away from it. Uh, again, treadmill, if you're stuck in the treadmill, this is what you gotta do. Uh, and that's it really. So here are some typical workouts and, and I, I will get more detail later, but I know uh, Renata does you know 800 meter interval workouts, um, adjust for grass, adjust for you know Stanley Park and the um, cinder surface. You can make all those adjustments, but you, you gotta run them faster than 3.4. That's just, you know. Um, same pace speeds, again, race modeling, always good to be familiar with the speed you're running at, you know, give or take a few percentage points for hills, wind, weather conditions, and a 10K runs good. Um, if you have a 3K loop in a park, that's also good to reduce pounding on legs. And then I also believe in running slower than race pace. And we call it over distance when we run 400 meters, we do like 800 or 600 meter repeats and six, five, four, three, two, one, the over distance you have to run a bit slower than what you want to run. So in this case, if you do a seawall run in Vancouver, a 10K run, even though 42 is your desired time, just go for a 50 minute, 55 minute easy run with your colleagues uh, or with me in 60 minutes, right? I can do it in 60 minutes, right? Uh, or just go for a nice hour and a half easy run close to the park. And just run it slower, run, run it at you know five minutes per kilometer because your kilometer speed's at 4.15. So just go and run a 5.15 or 5.15, one minute kilometer uh, slower. Just, you know, get the long run in, but don't kill yourself. And then, and then the last part before I open up the discussion and all the recovery methods we should follow is, you know, how do you break down the 20 weeks? Uh, so when I say ACC, I mean, A is uh, faster track workouts, B are same speed tempo, and C are long runs. So you can sort of slice and dice a few different ways. I know the old Canadian marathoner, Jerome Drayton, uh, who's, who was up until recently the Canadian <coughs> marathon, he would do something similar to this. He would focus on like the old GPP training and do you know a speed day and then two long run days. And then in the middle of the uh, programming in his periodization, he does the ABC. He does one workout of this, one of this and one of that. And then maybe towards the gets closer to competition time, you want to avoid that fast speed work for say hamstring reasons, or you start getting paranoid about you know uh, getting injured. So you start increasing the distance a bit and get some speed workout. And, and of course, the last last week of your of your race, you taper, and that's all should be like uh, you know uh, slower race pace speeds. Just you know getting ready, you're tapering. And so that's it really, that's the, the meat of the whole program. Um, I'll leave this sheet open and I will love to hear everyone's opinion, questions, challenge me, uh, ask questions. 
Uh, okay, Peter, Peter, go ahead. Yeah, I often hear, um, you know, the sort of the distance crowd, um, particularly around, you know, where I, 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 I coach. They, this has been something going on for some time about going on about recovery runs. And, and, and as opposed to other recovery modalities that we, the sort of things that we've been discussing over the past year, what would you prefer? Well, uh, would you prefer the concept, you know, working on, on, um, you know, so sort of getting, making sure you, you, you've done your stretching, your micro stretching and other recovery modalities as opposed to running again? I mean, it seems to me, well, what's well, your thoughts on that? Yeah, the first question is before you work out, what's the purpose of the workout? That's really it. And, and, and if you're feeling really bagged and feeling really tired, you'll probably do more harm than good by going for a run. So maybe you're better off going for a swim. Yeah. yeah. So it all, you really have to listen to your body before you do anything else. But just, you know, ask yourself, why are you running? What's the purpose of the workout? Yeah. I think a, a lot of the times they just program these things in. <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, I mean, this is why I hate doing it. Um, I mean, sorry for right now, but a lot of these athletes ask me for workouts, all these, you know, about 400 meter training workouts. And I never, never want to give um, a, a cookbook, you know, like a, um, I don't want to give them recipes to a cookbook. I, I want to explain to them. I said, look, I'm happy to give you a program, but I need to talk to you first and understand how the program works. Because anybody can just get a book and Tom Teller's book and just follow the program or even, Clyde Hart's program and just follow it. You can't do that. You have to really taper and adjust for the program. Richie? Uh, yeah, and I I think Malcolm and I spent a few days together so now we truly share a brain. He, he just put on there, it's a misnomer because what I was gonna say is it's not, act, it, a recovery run is actually part of the work you're doing in a sense. Right. It's just a lighter pace and it's not garbage. It's It should be good quality, but it's, so it's not like the kind of recovery we're talking about here, you know, and, and the only thing I'd add is in case of like, if I were trying to run much, a recovery run for me would be on a treadmill that's cushion enough or a bike or an elliptical just to keep from beating me to death. Cause I just can't handle much pounding. So, you know, it, it's still, it's still work, but it's, you know, intended to help you recover from the harder work. It's like a recovery day from 400. So the next day, recovery runs aren't, you know, you know, massage and ice and this and that. They're actually running to help pump things through you, but they're done for the purposes of recovery. So I think that's what Malcolm, maybe I'm, I'm maybe putting, I'm maybe misreading yeah. it. That's, it's a misnomer. Yeah. Well, the, well uh, having use of the other part of the brain, I think the other uh, thing you could do is run in the water. Uh, you know, get a flotation device, or even if you know, you, you can even run touching the, the ground because you've got a lot of buoyancy, and so there'd be recovery. But again, um, where is he? Oh, over there. Sorry, Jimson, looking for you. Um, the, the, the thing that's missing. Don't take this the wrong way. No recoveries are mentioned, and I think at one point you you've got something about intervals, and I, and I think with respect, you mean repetitions which ties into the fact that interval training is about the interval recovery. And so um, when I've been coaching longer events or in, you know, endurance events, I've always favored a breakdown of a distance, so 10,000 meters, you're trying to run 30 minutes, you'd run you know, high 250s, 254, 255 per thousand meters, but you'd only take 30 seconds recovery. And, and that ends up being a tremendous preparation um, for, for, for the event. Now you can't break a half marathon down to that, I don't think, but you could still do something like take 10,000 meters and, and break it into those kind of intervals. And then just, just I think from a historical point of view, this multi um, uh, speed, Idea, I think, uh, uh, well, was a Coe's father publicized it a lot, but uh, I think Frank Harwell was the originator of this in the early 70s, and he may have even had as many as five variants. But I, I think for what we're doing here, three is probably right. Can I ask a question? In the, it's a two part question. On the recovery runs, 
recovery workouts, what percentage of your normal heart rate would you be doing? And in addition to that, if you're going on a bike, whether it's a road bike, stationary bike, what adjustment for heart rate would you do for a bike, if any? Oh, good question. So heart rate zones, that's probably what started Renata and I talking because all these zones, you go to the health club and you see, you know, the fat burning zone and this zone, that zone. So that's a good question. I, we're going to be playing with that a bit, I think, over over the next few weeks because I think, I think she has a heart rate or an Apple Watch and we're going to monitor it. But it's, yeah, it's basically we need to uh, keep an eye on the, the speed and, and also the heart rate. And, and maybe at one point we can do a anaerobic test and just go on a treadmill and just raise the speed up every, what, two minutes. And then at one point it's going to start deflecting up and that's the point where you want to avoid. We, we'll know where her zones are. But for now, you know, we need to start getting comfortable with it. Um, I, I mean, I, I have my ideas of zones. And, and so let's say, for example, yeah. she does a workout and, 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 an, and an, an easy run is really too high to zone. We got to adjust the program. So, so, it all, so we have some ideas of what the zones should be, but we really <laughs> uh, tweak it, which is another reason if, why. What, what I was meaning, if you've got your zone for your aerobic threshold for your performance of proven runs, yeah. What percentage of that would you take to do a recovery run? Um, 65, 70%. I don't have the numbers here handy, but I do have some numbers for that. But it is it is a number to aim for, and then we would adjust for it. But it's very low. It's like 65, 70%. If, if yeah, but that's off max heart rate. Yeah, but which max heart rate? Right? <laughs> so, so you know, this is this is perfect because this is we just did a 15k slow recovery run on Sunday, and I think like I have my metrics with a heart rate monitor with all of that. So this is so wonderful because that's the the reason it's I can run more than three days a week, but I'm also a cyclist, so I run with a, a women's like race team, so I can do the thing is is how do I get my I can do anaerobic training on the bike. Do you know what I mean? So, and these, mm -hmm. this is where the zones and heart rate matter because I don't have to do it necessarily. Like I can do three runs and then go from there. And then when I look at my metrics, which is probably the most accurate this Sunday on my 15 K run, these are the things that I think will be really helpful. So when I look at my three runs this week, uh, let me see. They're on your computer or on your phone? It's on my phone. It's oh, amazing. Okay. Plus, okay. plus, actually, it's on my Strava, so you might even be able to yeah. see that. Um, well, I was going to say you could share it up there, but it's on your you phone. Can, you can hold it up. We'll probably be able to see it. You hold it. Okay. Yeah, right so, we'll see it. We're, we're yeah, so part, see. part B of the question, Renata, is see when you're going on the bike, do you use the same numbers for the heart rate for the same zone, or is it slightly different? Okay, so that on the bike, I haven't been using that because I just do laps of Stanley Park and I'm going, but I'm looking at my anaerobic. So I have all the metrics of zones, but I'm, and I have my heart rate also, but on the bike, I use my Garmin. I have to get a heart rate monitor and the Garmin with wind, like Richie was saying, it's insane how bad it is, but with running, it doesn't matter as much. So on my 15 K, my average pace was 5.32 kilometers. My average heart rate was 135 and my max was 153 on my 15k my aerobic zone was 3.6 and there was no anaerobic benefit when i look at my screen i can break it down more my stride length was 1.7 meters my vertical ratio was 8.8 percent .8%. my vertical oscillation was 9.7 my ground contact was literally 50 50 um, my average ground contact time 263 milliseconds and elevation gain was 253. We're going to share this data later on this document. We're, we'll keep it running so that we can just follow it over the next few, next 20 weeks. Perfect. And yeah. what I'll do is I'll, like I say, you'll see everything on my Strava anyway. And then we did 800 meter splits, which Jimson was talking about. We're going to do a track workout tomorrow, but we did like 800 meters at 430, 420, and 410, three times with 200 meters recovery. So those are the splits that I need to look at because right now I feel so strong. And your, your comment about like today, I don't have to do anything. And I'm like, I'm not going to put in those miles on running because running actually injures me more so. So now that I feel good, I actually have to not run. So I'm going to go to the pool. I'm going to, because I activity I do every day, but I don't want to do junk activity that's harming me. 
right? So that's why I've kept running to three times. I can run today, but what would be the purpose if I'm doing a hard track out workout tomorrow? I biked yesterday and did intervals around the park. So this is where I need the help of like, how do I stay injury free? I also get a massage every Friday. So I have some soft tissue work and then I should be taking a full day off and I never do. Right. So these are the things that are really important now. Renata, what's your access? You just said my key thing was pool. And that's my favorite thing in the world for a runner is getting in the pool. I but hate pools. Hate them. <laughs> like, now, what, hate, what hate. do you do when you go in the pool? Well, I, mean, I don't. I try not to. But when I do, what I will do is when I train for marathons, I, I did marathons when I was in a previous life. And then I would do pool running. And like, I love swimming in a lake or whatever, but I don't know. So what should I do? So now I have access to pools, maybe once a week, let's okay. say. Um, and so I don't know what to do in the pool. You know, getting into the pool is horrific for me. So I have to like really put that time in and now everything is measured because of covid you only get 45 minutes so i've got 45 minutes and we have a kids pool which is 237 meters so i can do endurance do you know what i mean it's so, in one length here's a question for you. what access do you have to sit imagine being at the end of the pool with your arms on the side of the pool so you're most of your half of your body is out of the water Actually, my condo has a pool. I'm sorry. I have a rooftop pool, but it just opened because of COVID. I have unlimited access to a right. pool. My bad. Because I'm gonna, I, I've never done this before, and I've used pool workouts for 30 years. And they are the things that, like, when my kids go to college, they call me back. I'm like, I wish we did that one week, one day a week pool workout. That was the thing that okay. I loved and helped me. I have never videotaped it. I'm going to try to get in the pool this week or next week and just videotape what I do and have you guys look at it as well um, and kind of explain how I've I've done it. That might be something that might be added in for recovery slash, you know, workout for you. I love that. Like I said, I should have accessibility. It's to not the pool swimming. Whenever I like. It's not swimming at no, all. No, that's cool. Literally I don't. I don't the side want to swim. Pool or standing in place, and it's and it's. Uh, I'll show you. Yeah. Hey, I'm Renata. Looking over your Strava, I found the workout I could keep up with you. Uh oh. <laughs> the two point one mile mile walk. <laughs> I can handle that. The rest of you need to be biking with Kevin, and uh, yeah, that's all I can handle. Tim, are you, are you talking about when when you're resting on the the rim of the pool, and then you're cycling your legs in the water? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yep. I got yep. I got to do and, some and of that. A lot of it is your legs are in the water sometimes, right. and sometimes your legs are coming above and coming down, and it's really like giving a massage to those hamstrings. Um, right. and beating them up, but it just is a recovery. But it, you know, once you see it, there's like three or four different things that, that I've done with it and you can take pieces oh. of it maybe. Yeah, yeah. video. You know, it, it, it works well and I had to do some, I was gonna say when I couldn't stand up, which sounds bad, but um, could I just address a little something about heart rate? The, um, the 220 mi minus the age, I think is something the fitness companies invented for, convenience and they put it on their bikes and on their treadmills and all the rest of it. Absolute nonsense. I, I have no familiarity with the methodology that you use, Jimson, which, which, which might be accurate. And certainly it sounds like, you know, being that 10 or so points lower is, is, is going to be more, more realistic. Higher, but higher, I, higher, higher is more realistic. I am right. I just blocked it out. It's higher, yeah. And and so, what what I did because the, the struggle I have with with working a heart rate out just based on the maximum heart rate is it ignores what your resting heart rate is, by definition, you know. So if if as a an athlete or you know exerciser you're taking your morning resting heart rate, you know, both laying down and then standing up then I would use the percentage between that resting heart rate and, and a perceived maximum. And I, and I did think, or I, I do think it was worthwhile trying to actually work out what, and you know, get an accurate figure for the, the athlete's maximum and then use a percentage between the two. Um, I mean, be, well, we, we agree that the, the 220 minus age is a nonsense. So, um, you know, when I was 70 and reasonably fit, it meant my maximum heart rate could only be whatever it is. You do the math. 
and and I'm cycling at a, you know 180, 185 beats a minute. So um, it, it makes no sense. Just a number. I'm not happy about it, which is why I mention it. But um, yeah, just a number. Hey, I had a, something you that you put up, and I saw it when you put it up a week or so ago. And when you talked about, you know, don't I can't remember how you put it in there, but you know, don't stress on the overloading the miles and the garbage miles and the just to do them kind of thing, which is a struggle we have with younger athletes. So the problem is we, you know, I have a freshman boy in the heat and humidity of Houston trying to run more, you know, a, a 40 minute run, half of that may be garbage, you know, so I tell him even to break up, run, run when it's cooler, break up runs, but Renata experienced runners can tell this a little more, but the key is that goes back to what I said earlier and, and that, you know, the traditional volume and intensity, it guides everything you know, that's very limited. If you've got, you know, a certain amount of volume and even the intensity isn't high, if the quality is low, it's bad for your body, it's beating for the sake of beating, and it's, you know, doesn't do much for you. And you, you're better off getting on a bike or better off getting on a treadmill or a, an elliptical or something if you want the, the work without pounding yourself. And, and, you know, that's a key too. And, so any of the the mileage, you know, it's just to get more in and it's so slow that it's worthless and all it does is wear out the system. You know, you've only got so much energy and and Renata, you're a lot younger than most of us on here, but you're not 29 anymore. No, so, I, like am you not, say, I am not 29. You know, I am very, you you very the, aware of it. <laughs> you're not even you're not even 49 like Malcolm. So that's why you've got to limit your, you know, you got to maximize the efficiency maximize the work minimize the wear and tear which comes with you know running a half marathon or a marathon anyway. yeah and i think you know now i can feel now just being at this age of metabolic exhaustion like when i haven't eaten well or slept it's such a different feeling than physiological muscle um, fatigue, right? So now I'm at a point where I can connect more, which is today, like, I know I could run, I could do a hard workout, but I'm doing a hard workout tomorrow. So it, there's your garbage miles. I just have the time and, and I'm an active person. So it's like sleep would be great, but I can't make myself sleep after work. Right. So this is where the struggle is always like, rest would be great but how do you do like you say active rest or or um promotional you know rest you can't i can't always make that happen either so i think that it's kind of finding that balance that in tune if this is a rest day what are my options for rest and then if i can sleep can i stay there right can i not do a workout and just really rest on my friday massage days right or do i just go for a walk like these are the things to look at yeah, well, with that in mind, because someone asked, uh, maybe Malcolm asked this, Jimson, and for Renata and Jimson, I mean, in that whole cycle, is there ever a ag an actual complete rest day, not just a recovery that's light, go like that, go for a walk? I didn't notice that's the only thing you did that day, or if you bike to a rim, it, is there ever in like a three week part of it or whatever a complete day off? Or is it I think we should definitely it's... make make a complete rest day. I mean, I would say a walk is a rest day. Um, right, I mean, right. right. Uh, but just that's it. Like that's what I'm allowed to do if I want. Or even walk, swim in the pool. I mean, if and you like you say you don't really like doing it, but even doing what Tim's talking about, some circuit type exercises, exactly. some light swimming, you know, swim around or or swim laps in the pool, not super hard, lightly. I mean, that's not much work and it's off the pounding. That's more what I meant, like day is completely not really doing work. Uh, yeah. And I think mentally, Richie, taking that day off is also really good just to, you know, have your mind regenerate itself and get refocused. Have you um, worked yeah. out? <laughs> sorry, Malcolm. I'm sorry. Your, your larger recovery structure i mean we're, we're talking about a day or two days off in a week if your cycles are a week are you for instance going three weeks with an increase then level on the fourth week which is in essence a form of recovery and then are you are you doing that kind of model yeah i mean that's traditionally yeah it doesn't always work out i find I, I find whenever i try to plan that three one three one three one I find, you know, life happens and gets in the way. You get injured, you got to travel. So I find you can plan for that. That's the way I always plan. But 
nothing goes according to plan right. from my experience in, in training. Sorry, Peter. No, I said I think you just stole my question. I was going to ask what what oh, Michael, shit, Michael are you, you? It sounds when you said you had a, a massage um, always on a Friday. It, it I got the impression you were using a seven day microcycle. Um, no, that's I'm just the only ask, day I could have a massage. <laughs> So Malcolm's asked my question already. Yeah. Yeah, three one would be ideal, but like I said, life happens. You know, work gets in the way, injuries. You got to visit a friend in the hospital. All these kind of things get in the way. But if we can keep it three one, three one, and get progressive, and take advantage of those easy weeks as well. But you know, like I said, we you have to monitor the situation and adjust accordingly. See, I know in 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 Canada and U.S. The U.S. Thanksgiving week is exactly four weeks from Christmas week. So when we were training, you know, in college, uh, we'd have three weeks in November, then a forced fourth week easy. Everybody heads home. Then back in December, three weeks solid, then another week off Christmas. So that so we try to plan for these things as well. Um, and then, like I said, with work and travel, that all gets in the equation. When you said like. A C C and the next one is like A B C and then A B B yeah. or C C C at the end. So those are basically like it's structure on basically a weekly cycle. Yeah. 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 Weekly or, or every yeah. four four weeks. Every yeah. Uh, three, four weeks. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, so what I, should I um this week then? So with my track workout tomorrow, should we just do this week and see where I'm gonna start wearing a heart rate monitor and then try and see where my zones are as I, because my riding is a little more erratic because I'll be doing longer rides and I, I don't pace myself on the rides. I just try and keep up with my buddy, which never happens. So then the question will be, uh, I guess we'll just see if I can start pacing my rides to accommodate for aerobic and anaerobic loading. And that's correct. I think, I think this is the first week is really week zero. It's like testing week. You're, you're finding, and getting all the numbers to see what your 5k time is, what your 800 meter times are, what your long runs are, which you did already. So we just need some sample data to go with. And, and after we know all the numbers, we can start planning week one next week. But this week, first week, just get feel the program, uh, start getting used to the devices, the heart rates and all that stuff. And, and we'll measure from there. And should I try to do a 5K um, at my threshold? Um, maybe I'll throw that in somewhere to see where I am. And then at the following week, a 10K threshold so that I start to build that. Yeah, I would like to see that. But the thing is, if you, if you, if you think 130 is too ambitious of a goal, then that would I think you. it is. Yeah. I think we should go we'll maybe go. let's go with one 140 and then if I because I, we just did the metrics and I'm like that's crazy I am not my 25 year old self where I used to do that so I'm not there anymore which okay. is totally well, cool. well I thought all of us have gone we've already got money in Vegas on you running a 130 and now you're changing it on us <laughs> <laughs> look if really? I can run it this really? would be great we're gonna get <laughs> you know, a they... small cut you know, Jimson said, especially on a treadmill, you can do like the hockey stick and the bit where it curves up, you go over your threshold. Yeah. You should not be doing that on a stationary bike at first, at a set cadence, and see how your heart rate goes up. So then you know what cadence you should be cycling at, and then when you go out on a road bike, you can use the gears up and down to try and maintain that cadence, especially on a long ride. Yeah, and you know, I have all the the tech tools to make all of that happen. So I love that idea. I also have like a, I have an indoor trainer that already has done my FTP testing for 20 K and stuff on the bike. Right. But what I want to do is redo that and then start to see, because like I say, another thing is, is it's not flat and that's where the FTP testing on my bike is better at home. Um, but I can do the park. Stanley park is 10 K, right. But you go up a hill and there's some elevation and you go down. So, but as long as it's consistent and standardized, as long as I use that as my loop, that can be something that I can use to. Remember in that Scotland's the only country in the world where you leave your house, you go up a hill and to get back to your house, you go up another hill. <laughs> it should be impossible, but, but, but trust least, me, that's what we do. But at least it's cold and raining while you're doing it. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, also so I, I, I just looked hill, back on the, the, the document there and I, I went through it quickly so it's just easier than me trying to find it. And it may not sit on there. When is this 
and where is this? Is it in Vancouver? Is it, when is it the race? October 11th in Victoria. So it's almost okay. literally flat. Oh, so it's in Victoria, like along the coast instead of- Along in, the water. Okay, that's yeah. what, that was the third question is what's the train? So October in Victoria is probably gonna be really nice weather and it's not like you're- It will probably be four, four or five degrees actually it can be pretty cold um, yeah. in that sense. I mean, it's not gonna be like a heat spell in- no, no, no. Vancouver in July or something. Yeah. No, 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 no. It'll be really comfortable. It's it's a really fast. Um, it's a fast course. I used to do my marathons and get my my best times on it because it's flat. It's fast. Um, it'll be really nice. Well, the Houston marathons in January and it's every once in a while it's like forty degrees, fifty degrees and dry or only really nice. And then the next year it's. 72 and misting and 100 and just people just are dropping like flies it's just brutal yeah the thing with a, a fall marathon or half marathon is that you train all summer in the heat <laughs> if it's a hot day you're fine if it's cold day you're fine but a spring marathon is is worse because you train all winter and cold and if that spring day is 30 celsius you're dead meat and that has happened to me before where on may 30 it's 30 celsius and Boom. Yeah. We did that in, uh, in Kosovo, Jimson. We trained through the winter in Kosovo, which could be up to minus 13. And we did this, the half marathon walk. Now, the first hill you go over is 185 metres higher than Ben Nevis. And wow. it's a, uh, you have to be with a 10 pound pack, your weapon, uniform, and boots. So the day we do it in May, it was 29 and a half degrees up to 31 degrees. The weather changed like that on the Friday. I was dying. Oh man, was I dying. And an Egyptian said to me, oh, it's very warm, my friend. I said, you from Egypt? I'm absolutely dying here. It, was, it took us about 45 minutes longer to do them we did in training. And it, oh, it was torture. So you're 100% right, yeah. Yeah, weather is a big factor. I mean, I, I mean, I wish people in Tokyo good, good luck this summer when they make it. Yeah. Like, or, or both, both of the fans, both <laughs> of the spectators. Don't you think they're going to have to start the marathon at about six a.m.? Yeah, they're, and, uh, they're holding it up in the north. They're holding all the endurance yeah. events in. Was it Sapporo? Yeah. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Else? They did that in Atlanta. Remember, they lied. They said, Atlanta, this is the timetable. As soon as they got awarded it, they said, oh, the marathon will be at 7.30 a.m. Oh, what? Because of the heat. Yeah. They had to change it. Yeah. Actually, any, any questions from either Chris Coy, Kevin, or Rostam on programming or the overall program of the outline? Any comments? Rostam's or... thinking about the half marathon when he retires from the deck. <laughs> well, I, I just have a thought. This is Chris. Um, I've never trained anybody past 800 meters, so I'm totally out of my depth a little bit here. But there's one workout that I really love in terms of just building fitness quickly. And um, what's that guy at Christensen's? I forget his first name. 800 meter guy. Scott Christensen in Minnesota. Scott. Yeah, that four minute on, four minute off workout, four times. And uh, this is a workout that I used to give my 800 meter people and just incredible results from it. It's where you, you kind of jog for four minutes. Well, you do a little 10 minute warm up. You jog for four minutes then. And then it's a four minute threshold run. So it's pretty hard run to, to as hard as you can run and maintain for four minutes. And then back into a four minute jog and repeat four times mm -hmm. and just a fantastic workout i started doing this myself actually recently i i, I love the workout it's just excellent and it, it turns out it, it's a 45 minute run when you when you're done if you do it four times with a 10 minute warm-up and then a little bit of a cool down at the end and i'm not sure how it would apply to the longer distances but my mind says yeah that would work it'll be a good little breakup workout to use once in a while i don't know what do you think yeah, I like it. I mean, another wave three comes here. We're all locked down again for, uh, you know, yeah. four months. Uh, and, and all you have access is to a golf course. Yeah, hey, that works. Sure. I it's, mean, I'll take that. 
So would that be one is, of my track? Would that be a track workout then? Would that be considered? Do you know what I mean? Like, how do I, because I love that. I mean, I would do that today, but I'm doing a track workout tomorrow. How do I, this is going to be my biggest issue is like, how do I incorporate safely and how do I recover? My biggest question is, is how do I know I'm recovered from my last workout? How do I do this stuff? Like I say, I know physically, metabolically now when I'm tired, but that doesn't always coincide. I need objective I need an objective. This is what you did. This is where you hit today. You need to hit these zones because of yesterday. How do I make it so specific? Because those are my, those are my blind spots. A very, very, very poor method is mo is your morning heart rate. That's the old fashioned traditional way of how you recover from your workout. Um, Malcolm would probably agree with that. <laughs> your morning heart rate. But you, you can have a bad dream and wake up, ah, my, my rent's due. And they, oh, so that's a bad example. So uh, yeah, uh, there are tools out there. There are HRV monitors. And I mean, there's all these gadgets out there, but the best indication is you, how you feel. Um, and then you check your legs, check any soft tissue damage, if you have Achilles problems. Um, it's really a custom approach. But, and so Chris, I, if you know, uh, we'd call that like hard tempo and we do some of those like they're like hard tempo intervals or repetitions. And we'll do something like that for cross country where it's, you know, six minutes. They have them do that in the summer on their own, no matter where they are, they don't need a track and it gets them fit for and mentally prepared later on for mile repeats. But, you know, it's jog for 10, 12 minutes, go right into a hard six minutes, then light six minutes, hard six minutes, light six minutes, hard six minutes, jog down. But you could, you could act the reason to that he's saying to you, you kind of go out and run. It's the perfect kind of thing. You don't need to be locked down, but you also don't want to do that on the track because it kind of frees you from worrying about that. You got your metrics. You're going to know during it while you're on the light part, you can look or after it, how far you went for that time period. So if you have a goal ahead of time, you know, and they, let's say you break it up into, you know, two kilometer bits, you know what your pace is per kilometer you want, you run strong for, and it's faster than half marathon pace, but if you run, you know, a good, hard, strong 2K uh, or, or, you know, that type of distance, whatever that is in time wise. So the, he said four minutes, you know, so that may be where you are. Four minutes is perfect, or it might be five minutes, run five minutes, lightly five minutes, five minutes. It's, it's like an organized fart lick, but the beauty is you can do it anywhere. And if you don't have the watch, you, well, I don't know, how do I know how far I really went, how well I did? Well, you have all that. So you don't have to do it around the track and do it, you know, go out on the route where the, the marathon is or go do it through Vancouver. You know, just looking at your map is like, God, there's nothing that nice anywhere, you know, around here. The, probably the ugliest place in Vancouver is prettier to run than here. So enjoy being somewhere where you don't have to, you're freed from the track and distance, all that. Run hard for four minutes or five minutes, run relax for four or five minutes. And but, yeah, the but, seawall is actually perfect for that. that. Yeah, but it's definitely something you don't do the day before or the day after another hard work. I mean, that in itself, if you do it right, you know, you might have a recovery run the next day and a bike the next day, and then maybe something again three days later that's more quality. I don't know if that's what Chris is talking about. I'd say that's that's not paired for a half mile. Or if they do that, the next day they're doing something light because they're probably fried if they're a half mile. Yeah, no, it's it it can be a very very tough workout, and but it's an excellent one, and I I love it. And you're right, it's totally adaptable. You can extend that time uh, for the long, you know, for someone who's going for a half marathon, let's say not an 800 meters. So yeah, I mean, I think it's just a really really good quality workout. Um, to use love it okay kevin anything to add from your deck background to a half marathon <laughs> no i mean really i'm just kind of i mean just kind of sitting listening and kind of taking it in and thinking about it you know and you know I, I think one of the things that kind of you know that i really do is just the variety um of the training um especially you know in in, in the combined events you know for the you know, 800 is a little bit different, but the 1500, um, you know, it's, it, to me, it's always been about, um, you know, a high level of fitness, you know, and then the racing pieces, you know, you know, as long as I can get them familiar with, you know, what, you know, their, what their proper pacing is, you know, to kind of get going, um, you know, cause that's the biggest piece. Cause it's, that's, you know, depending on what the, what those two days look like, 
you know, weather wise and effort wise and, you know, psychologically, you know, that it's just going to be so different every time you attack it. So, you know, it's, it's just about creating as, you know, the highest level of fitness as you can, you know, and after you get out there in that first lap and, um, you know, you hit that pacing, you know, then it's just a matter of competing, you know, but I think, you know, from the training side, you know, the variety I think is, is a huge piece. And again, I mean, I just kind of, to me, that lays a foundation for, you know, just your fitness levels, you know, and then you progress off of that. Yeah. You know, variety is the spice of life. And, and like I said, this week, this new testing week, get a feel for all your paces, your timings, uh, new equipment, figuring how things work on your, on your phones. Uh, you know, yeah. The next week get serious. I know Kevin just said variety in terms of general variety of things, but there's, you know, like you're doing a lot of variety of things anyway, whether it's pool, biking, uh, running on the track, in the park, on the seawall. Um, you know, Peter Thompson always talks about the more variety, and we do this for cross country, the more variety you can, the better the proprioception, the better the, you know, you're protecting the foot and the foot strike and everything all the way up the chain. Some people I know, don't want if they don't do it already and it depends on where you're it's like some people never want to run on grass if they're afraid they're going to roll their ankle some you know but you know running on heck if there's a, a a dirt trail in a park it's good you know footing if there's great grass in part of the park if there's you know asphalt you know if there's track surface if there's an old cinder track somewhere you know whatever uh, you know, the more of those varieties there, just the better, not just variety of the, the method of training, elliptical, bike, pool, running, whatever, but also the, the surfaces, you know, the more you can safely do that. I mean, don't be one of these crazy, I don't know, maybe you've done this, like the mountain runners over like boulders and rocks. And that's like, I mean, that hurts me just watching it. My ankles start doing circles, just seeing that, but but the more safe terrain changes, the better. Um, you know, that's just something else that I think helps protect you in the long run when you're that much training. Yeah, no, we've got access. Basically, we do um, the park in like a like a wood chip sort of gravel. We did 15k through the park, but then half like on the road. I do the seawall. The tempo stuff is on the UBC track, so it's like that, which is really beautiful. I actually love it. And then I mean, we ride all over elevation and hill climbing, and like we'll ride up Cyprus this weekend, and uh, you know, do some big elevations. So I love that. The biggest thing for me is you're right. I've got to get the pacing down with my watch and see, start doing the pacing because my running partner does it all, and I just follow him, and he just tells me. But he's doing a half Ironman in July, so I'm doing all of his all of his stuff because he's going for, um, but really the half iron is a half marathon also, but his is stretched, right? So um, really I've just had the luxury of following, but now I'm gonna get a little bit more in the know. The question is, is for my FTP test of the 5K, that will be my tempo run then next week. Can I do two tempo runs and a slower run? Is that okay? Can I go Monday, um, Monday, a tempo Tuesday, a longer or Wednesday, a longer run Friday, a tempo. Um, and then I guess I think you're going to answer with how do you feel? And then metabolically, if I think I can handle it, obviously see my volume of riding pending how far we ride and then play around. If I feel metabolically tired, if I see it through my heart rate and my zones, I can figure that out. And that's where I'm going to really get clear because that's where, as long as I can keep up the pacing that you put and I feel good, then and I'm hitting my targets. Yeah, just avoid avoid two hard days in a row. That's the short answer. So you can do a medium, 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 or you can do uh, hard, easy. Um, but yeah, but if it's yeah two hards, no, avoid that as much as possible. Yeah, but if Perfect. you're like you said, if you do Monday uh, tempo, Wednesday long, Friday tempo, which is kind of two hards and a medium between, you may feel oh, okay. I, I handled that okay. Well, then see how you feel the next Monday. Then you might. So that may be like your third week when you're doing something harder. And then the fourth week is a little more relaxed and maybe a, you know, a recovery run, a longer run. Cause you may, and you may find out I feel great and I can do that two weeks in a row. And then I need a recut. You may find after one week of that, I have to go easier. And that just depending on you, you know, and yeah. you kind of learn as you go. 
Yeah, I've got to connect with that. You guys, thank you. I'm sorry. I have to go. I have a patient now, but this was so, so wonderful. Thank you for taking the time. I'm on Strava, so you can see I'm going to, I don't know how to use text, so it all just loads up there anyway. And then Jimson, you and I will connect um, maybe this okay. weekend. Yeah, we're on WhatsApp. Sounds good. Okay, cool. you guys, thanks so much. Have a great week. Yeah, before we go, actually, um, to say five minutes, I believe we have uh, Arnie, Richie. We have yeah. Arnie online. Richie. Hey, Arnie. I'm going to go, you guys. I'll see you. Thanks, Renata. Take care. Hi, Renata. Hi, Renata. Hey, how are you? Good, Arnie. I think, I think you know Richie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, so, I just listen to everything. I get a little bit late because I wasn't training, but I'm here, you know, happy to join and happy to learning something from you guys. Yeah, yeah welcome. Uh, if you have any ideas for another talk or topic, let us know. We're always open to ideas. All right, yeah, let me think something and I can write on the mail that you sent. Well, one thing, all of you will be invited if we do this. Hey, did, Arnie, did you figure out a time to do that thing we talked about? With the uh, I, I, I'm going to have more time now in July. So this weekend is the last meeting I'm here in Mexico. So after that, i would be, you know, ready whenever. Okay, well, get ahead with me. What we've been talking about doing is doing like a local workshop where um, like in Arnie's case, he'd have some athletes out there at the track, maybe some local coaches, they're allowed to come in and watch. And he works with, you know, talks a little about the training, works with them and somebody's there zooming at all. So you're listening to him talking and we haven't worked out exactly of, you know, if there's a, you know, the person's really close and you got a microphone or else you're talking loud, I don't know about the quality of me, but you know, doing that and you're watching it. So then, there's people on hand listening to him and watching with these athletes and watching demonstrations of things, but then also people can zoom in and join and watch. Them. So that's something we're working on. And I know that I think the biggest piece of that is somebody on their phone doing that. Well, that's great. Well, if you're outside on a track and you're 15 feet away, you may not be able to hear the person talking or anything, who knows, but um, you know, there are ways of improving that. We're just trying to get something done and gets, you know, he's in Mexico. We're trying to get somebody in Bahamas doing something, somebody in Puerto Rico doing something. Are you talking about doing that live? What? Right. Right. Yeah. Uh, and it's live. Zoom there. Yeah. Or or doing it and recording it, which might be better for the audio part and then putting it out there and people can watch. Yeah. But, you know, having I, I it do the thing. similar thing done before um it was an Ash, Ashley Kovacs was it was a webinar that England Athletics organized yeah. um, and, and we had her talking live, but then this was a section of, of, of example of coaching. Yeah. She was able to talk about it after the video, after the coaching video, which went on for about maybe 40 minute session. Yeah. Um, which was very valuable, very useful. I found it very useful because obviously it throws coach. Right. So, yeah. Arnie, but, where are you in Mexico? I mean, Guadalajara, Jalisco. I don't know if you. Guadalajara? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so it's, uh, I think it's the second big city in Mexico. So we have like uh, maybe four or five million people here. It's a big city. Yeah. West Coast. And yeah. West Coast. Pacific. West Coast, East Coast, West Coast. I think it's the Pacific nearby, like two hours. We're yeah. on the beach in the Pacific. Okay. Well, we'll make sure we come one day. Once this pandemic is over, trust me, we'll come and visit. <laughs> I'd like to be there now. Yeah. Oh, sure. I, I thought we were all going to Scotland first. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Close with me. Next summer, Birmingham. Alan, Alan's Brian the Iron Brew. That's what he told me. No problem. <laughs> yeah. What is Iron Brew? It's a soda. It's a soda. It is the, it's the only country in the world where Coca-Cola is not the number one soda is Scotland and it is iron brew is the number one soda in Scotland. And it's kind of yep. like a cream soda, yeah. but it's not like Coca-Cola. It's got a secret recipe. Nobody knows how to make it, but they actually had to import it to the United States. They had to bring the sugar content down. Otherwise they wouldn't be able to sell it in the United States. There is a sugar free version you can buy here. But the, you know what? This, whole bottle, extra. this is, this is half a liter. It's only got hundred calories in it. Not wow. bad. And it's only got 15 uh, milligrams of uh, sodium and 24 grams of carbs and 24 grams of sugar. 
It went, my wife and I were walking along the Rhine in Cologne. I was at the Sport University there. And you buy the big bottles of the beer and that Kelsch beer and go in and, it, you know, the pubs, you know, it costs more. So we just go in and get one because you can walk outside with it. And my wife looks at the, I have one basic rule on beer. Fruit does not go in beer. Ah. And she likes the beer with lime. And that, so she gets a, she sees the Bex beer with lime. And I asked the guy, he looked like he was Indian. And I said, how do you have Bex with lime? with the German purity law, like 1664 whatever, water, malted grains, hops, yeast. Those are the only ingredients allowed by law. He goes, they brew it in the United States and import it back to Germany to sell it. <laughs> import it, you just can't brew it there. It's like, oh God, world is, civilization is coming to an end. Oh. So are we happy once a month to meet up? Was that too, too long? Do you want to no, no, absolutely not. Absolutely not. I think, I think what we talked about was something like this, and then two weeks later, more one of us talks about something, or we just talk about, you know, yes, and have fun. Um, and then two weeks I later, personally think a couple, I think, personally think a couple of weeks at the longest, really. Yeah. So yeah. every two weeks, I mean, and this, the one in between is casual, the other, you know, yeah. every other this week. This is my salvation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. This week, you, you guys all reset my, you know, <laughs> I can't tell you how Except happy my I am. Is zero. It's, it's great. I can't tell you how happy I am. I can come and not be there for like 10 minutes and have to go to like to recess. You know, like this is this yeah. was like the highlight of my week, knowing I was going to be able to be here for the whole time. So, so is this same time going to work or are we talking about another date and time? Yeah, you know, like, like Wednesdays one once a month, but then on Mondays, once a month, two weeks later. So it's Wednesday, Monday, Wednesday, Monday, or I mean, l let us know, right? I mean, we're open to anything. <laughs> This time suits me a lot better. The days yeah. don't really matter to me, but this time suits me a lot better. Yeah. I know I know we've lost some bodies, but going back, and obviously some of this depends on Richie and when he's available, um, th this was the time we started out at. Yeah. We had a drop-off when we switched to the Mondays, which, which we had to do, I understand. So um, is there a need to find another time? I think... The most impacted was Tom Walsh because it was nine o'clock at night for him in, in Berlin. But um, the other folk in the UK, it's eight o'clock, right? Yeah. And then when we get to yeah. the winter, it's seven o'clock. Okay, well, we can go once, well, once a week, you want to do it. But if we do once a week again, we need a topic. We really need to have a topic well-defined ahead yeah. of time. Well, I think, I think the every other week is good. Okay. And maybe like what I say, like today is a, even though you you and Renata presented it, we maybe try to have a speaker, and then two weeks later, one of us maybe brings up a topic, or we say, "Hey, let's talk about the Olympics coming up or the trials yeah. in wherever." And then two yeah. weeks later, we have another speaker we try to get in. And I, I also on that notice, I, I hadn't I've been so busy I hadn't tried to get in touch with Dan, and I know like somebody's saying, you know, a lot of this stuff is like. You know, speaker fee stuff for any kind of thing. I'm going to just say, hey, it's like eight of us that get together. I've been doing this for a year. It's yeah. we people just come talk. It's you know, Lauren was on here. Others, it's just kind yeah. of if you don't mind that. If if you do, if you don't have time for that, no big deal. Yeah, but I, th I think Dan has a altruistic side to him that right. Um, I, I think you can tap into. I I certainly don't mind trying to speak to him and, and maybe even get Lauren to talk to him about it. Yeah. Okay. But also, um, if, um, I don't know if we've got a subject for two weeks time, but either in two weeks time or in four weeks time, I don't know if anybody else has been on the mental health and looking after coaches webinars, but I'm happy to do a summary of that and throw in my two cents worth. Oh, that's somebody, an American phone. Someone lost my number. Sorry. I was kind of hoping Peter or Jimson could get like Megan and Harry on too. I don't know if they charge, but you know. Yeah. Yeah. A lot. <laughs> I, we could have real entertainment. Rossum's got a pair of athletes that could talk and they'd keep us like rolling. <laughs> Richie, I'd be more than happy to ask Fred Samara. Um, yeah, it'd be great. If, if you don't know Fred Samara, he's he's the head coach at Princeton for 40 years. 
uh, Hall of Fame, 76 decathlete Olympian, um, really phenomenal. He, he would do it as long as it's probably later in the summer. He'll be out at the trials along with probably you and a bunch of other people next, you know, two weeks from now. So I'll, I'll definitely ask him. He's a neighbor of mine. He coaches my son. I'm sure he'll be, he'll be happy to do it. It'll be something different for him. Okay. So, all right, I'll, I'll check into that. Okay. Okay. Let's, um, okay. Let's get over. Oh, and, the, and then we are working on another, um, a lady who is, truly a therapist a physical therapist and a coach um i think actually jimson you heard her it was on the altar the lady who was on the altus panel jamie uh gosh i forgot now livingston and go see if i mean i've just tried to join that group and i've you know they wanted to know why you wanted to join and in it i asked her if she'd be interested um in um, you know, go, going back to our original mission, which was uh, recovery and regeneration. Sounds good. Okay. Okay. So two weeks time, we will meet up. Same time. Same time. Same yeah, day. So this time, I think this time works for most of us. I think the only person, uh, yeah, one person couldn't make it, but the rest could. And okay. And okay. Jensen, thank you. Thank you very much on a personal note for helping Timmy out. Oh, yes. That's coming up this this week. I'll do that right after this. I appreciate it. Yeah, he, he was, he's excited about that and uh, I appreciate it. So no problem. we'll get, we'll get a lot of, a lot of traffic. Trust me. So it'll be good. For him. <laughs> okay. Okay. Okay guys. So in two weeks time, can I, uh, okay. today, Thanks, everybody. See you. Take care. Cheers, see you, everybody. Take care. Bye. See you. Thank you. Bye.